What's up? MKBHD here. And if you followed me over the past couple weeks on Twitter or Instagram, then you've witnessed it. It's gone down again for the third straight year, the Blind Smartphone Camera Test 2020. So this originally started as an idea to sort of crown an unofficial best unbiased smartphone camera. But as we've learned from doing this, it's turned into a much more philosophical, psychological test on social media. So here's how it works. Behind the scenes, we take 16 smartphone cameras that all came out this year, and a good variety too, all the way from the favorites, the titans, the heavy hitters, all the way down to some mid-range phones and even budget phones. And we organize them all into a sort of seated bracket style of what we think is fair, and then we let them loose. We label each one with a letter A through P, and then we go through and take the exact same photo from the same spot with every single phone and put them side by side and have you guys vote on them on Twitter and Instagram stories, which you think is better. You don't know what phone you're voting for, you just pick a letter. And the final results are pretty much always wild and at least a little bit unexpected. Just a couple spoilers slash examples for you. Uh, we've done this three years running. No one phone and actually no one company has ever won more than once. And actually the iPhone has never made it out of the first round, ever. Now listen, this isn't a scientific test at all. Matter of fact, it's kind of the opposite of a scientific test. A lot of people on Twitter and Instagram were wondering why we didn't do a, a sample control photo or something like that from a DSLR. We were just keeping it super simple, bracket style. We might be surprised by the winner, but no matter what happens, we're gonna learn a lot about the way our brains work looking at pictures. So with that being said, after over 10 million votes this year, let's go over the results. So here's the initial bracket of those letters. And here are the phones behind those letters. So now you can see all of the first round matchups, the way they were seated. And if you want, you can go ahead and pause the video right now and go ahead and fill out your bracket. Go ahead, make your predictions, knowing which cameras you think are the best, knowing how they'll compare to each other, which one do you think should go all the way to the end and come out on top. Go ahead. All right, you've written that down. You didn't fast forward, you didn't cheat. Now let's go through how the actual bracket went. Spoiler alert, you're probably wrong. But okay, first photo uh, was just a picture of me. So I'm wearing a black shirt, I'm in front of a window, and there's plenty of other things to judge the photo from. So there's colors, there's skin tones, of course, the red controller, the yellow ottoman, blue sky, blue couch, colorful pillow, green plant, and lots of dynamic range happening. But at the end of the day, the most scientific part about this was our goal was to take the type of photos that most people would normally take. So a lot of human subjects, and you'll see more of that coming up. But also we didn't tap to focus because what we actually learned from Google after our previous results is they have a lot of data suggesting most people don't tap to focus. So we didn't. Anyway, here's how the first round went. So starting off here with Moto Edge, that actually beat iPhone SE right off the bat. Then we have Mate 40 Pro getting a pretty huge win over the Poco F2. The Poco was kind of a favorite from previous years, but there goes that one. Then you have Pixel 5 scoring a huge win over the Oppo Find X2 Pro. Then you have LG Wing losing to Zenfone 7 Pro. Squeaks out that win over here. Then on the other side, we have Surface Duo, never really stood a chance against the Sony Xperia 1 Mark II, so that was a win we were probably all expecting. Then Mi 10 Ultra did get a win against the OnePlus 8 Pro. And iPhone 12 Pro Max got absolutely destroyed by the mid-range OnePlus 8T. And then last but not least, our defending champ, the Note 1 last year, Note 20 Ultra does get a win over Pixel 4a. So go ahead, check your brackets. If you still have a perfect bracket, you're probably lying, but that's, that's a lot in one round. So next photo was a dimly lit top-down, kind of replicating more like bar lighting with a warm Edison bulb off camera, mixing with far away window light. So again, lots of colors and lots of textures again. We made this whole setup. Uh, not quite dark enough for any of these phones to kick on night mode. And you even get a little dynamic range test with the candle in there. So with this next round, with a, a lot of narrowing down happening already, we have Mate 40 Pro taking the win over the Edge Plus. Maybe not the biggest upset ever, but those phones are close in price. That's a win for the Mate. Then you have the Zenfone 7 Pro squeaking out a win over the Pixel 5. That I think a lot of people would consider an upset considering how much we like Pixel 5's camera. 
Then over here, Mi 10 Ultra gets the win over Sony Xperia 1 Mark II. That's a dub. And then the Note 20 Ultra scored, I'm gonna double check this, but I believe the biggest ever win in the history of this competition, scoring 95% of the votes against OnePlus 8T. So that's a pretty huge win. So now, maybe not so many upsets this round, except maybe Pixel losing, but again, learning a lot of interesting stuff, but we'll get to that in a second. Next round. So the semifinals photo was a good one. It's me holding up my R5, which is all black, in front of a couple different colors, yellow cement barrier, red wall, black asphalt, and then blue sky behind it. And in this one, all the photos by themselves had to focus on the red ring, so you get a nice little depth of field comparison too. So in this round, we have Zenfone 7 Pro squeaking out a win over the Mate 40 Pro, impressively. So that, that was a close race. A lot of votes on both Twitter and Instagram, but that was decided narrowly. And then over here we have Mi 10 Ultra getting the win over Note 20 Ultra in the Battle of the Ultras. So at this point, we're gonna have a new winner because we had a Huawei Mate Series win the first year and we had the two Samsungs colliding in the finals last year. So this time, they've all been eliminated for various reasons. And one of these two is gonna be the champ. On to the finals. So the last round, the pumpkin photo. And I think this one, it, it might just look again like a simple subject in broad daylight, but it has a lot of stuff here that's taken in mind stuff we found through the whole contest. There's a method to the madness. But either way, when it came down to it, the Asus Zenfone 7 Pro did squeak out a very narrow win over the Mi 10 Ultra in the finals, therefore crowning it your new People's Choice Award 2020 Blind Smartphone Camera Test Champion. It's December Madness. Now, okay, there's a lot to take in about how we ended up here. But first of all, from the last two years, the, the main thing we really got from that, that we learned, is that when you put two photos side by side, it brings out a very specific reaction from people's brains, which is hold everything else the same. To an extent, people will just pick the brighter photo. Makes sense. But this year, we definitely got some more nuanced information that's really important, actually. Now, first, let me just say, if you were clicking through the photos and thinking, oh, this is just a bunch of pretty simple random photos without much care put into them. It was kind of designed to look that way, but there's a lot of variables in each photo that have a lot to do with the way your brain perceives that photo. A lot of different colors, a lot of different focal lengths, backgrounds, style of photo. Uh, we didn't get to do action photos or night photos, but there's some really good stuff in here. So from all this, I think there's three main things that we picked up. One, we have a new winner. Two, white balance is underrated, and three, Twitter versus Instagram. So first of all, yes, the new winner is the Asus Zenfone 7 Pro. Probably pretty surprising winner for most people, guessing most of you didn't have this winning the bracket, although, if you were paying attention last year, this one took some great photos and only lost by a slim margin. But it's got an improved triple camera system this time, the 64 megapixel main camera that bends down to 16 megapixel photos. And there's also, they toss in a 3X telephoto and an ultra wide. Nothing too crazy, except for the fact that the cameras flip around and become probably the best selfie camera in any phone, which is sick. So it's not the most extreme, crazy 100 megapixel camera or anything like that, but if you go back through the rounds, while some had random white balance misses or some artifacting or would just blow out a photo, dynamic range, something would go wrong once in a while. You know, this phone just kind of had a clean, consistent exposure each time, just didn't miss. This motherfucker don't miss. No, he's fucking good. That motherfucker don't miss, man. He's good. In the heat of battle, he don't miss. No. Okay, so white balance has been a major key new factor from our understanding from the smartphone bracket this year. And I'd go so far as to say that it looks like this has been the reason that the iPhone has lost in the first round every single time. See, the other thing we learn putting photos side by side is if you have brightness the same and all other things the same, people will choose the photo that's a little bit more saturated, a little bit more vibrant looking which also makes sense, but it's to an extent, you can't just crank saturation all the way through the roof, 
But generally, if you have two photos that are almost the same and one of them looks a little more pale, it'll lose. So we know what white balance is, right? It's generally how warm or how cool a photo or video will look. And uh, a good white balance has pure white looking like pure white. Now the nuance with white balance is this. In photos that have more warm colors, more reds, orange, yellow, that type of thing, the warmer the white balance, the more saturated it will actually make those warm colors feel, and the less saturated it will actually make those cool colors feel. And the opposite is also true. So in a photo with lots of cool colored things, a cooler overall white balance will make those things look more saturated by a bit, and those warm things will look less saturated. So stay with me. So in this first photo, white balance was a major deciding factor because many of the colors in the frame are warm. You have my warmer skin tone, the yellow ottoman, the, the red piece here, the red controller, and even the sunlight streaming in onto the wall behind me. And a lot of smartphones are all over the place with white balance, even from shot to shot. But when they go too cool, my black shirt starts to go blue, my skin looks less saturated, a little bit more pale, and the whole photo shifts. This is the iPhone 12 Pro Max's first round shot. And you know, there is a lot of detail and sharpness, sure, but it's by far the coolest temperature, and plus the whole boosted exposure is so bright that it also blows out the sky behind me, which would have looked even more blue if you could see it because of the cooler temperature. That is of course very different from the OnePlus photo that beat it. So really the question is why does the iPhone and why do some phones so consistently have such a cool hue, a blue tint to the white balance? And obviously I'm not behind the scenes, your guess is probably as good as mine, but my theory would be that on photos of people with fairer skin tones, which is most people, it doesn't affect the skin tone look quite as much. You can get away with it. And also blue skies will look more blue than it would if you were biasing warm. Second round, there was a lot happening. And I think the number one factor most people settled on was just how much of the candle they could see in that photo. And that's just a straight up dynamic range test. And in every matchup, the photo with more dynamic range won. But also everything in the photo is pretty warm. The candle is orange. The salad has some reds in it, the yellow lemon, and even of course the wood table, everything is sitting on. Lots of good little details in the bread and the lettuce and the placemat to pick up on here. Then in the third round, we have a lot of, again, neutral and warmer colors. We have my hand with the skin tone. We have the black camera with the red ring. We have the asphalt in the background. So we have the four remaining phones, but I took a reference photo on the iPhone just for fun. And it was blue, man. I, I feel like it would have lost in this round again if it got this far in the first place because it was so blue. Now, a photographer looking through a lot of these, I had uh, some photographer friends messaging me as this was going on. A photographer looking at this would probably not be so concerned about white balance, because at the end of the day, that's just a slider you can fix. And even exposure, as long as it's somewhat accurate, that's a slider you can fix. What we really want is as much information as possible, as much detail and dynamic range so that you can make the photo you want in the edit. And that's one way of thinking about the photo. I think the other way is just, hey, this is a compressed photo on social media, just do the best you can with it. And speaking of compression. So this blind test was held on both Instagram stories and Twitter where you could do votes. And it turns out what we learned is Instagram stories and Twitter compress and show your photos in very different ways. So this was the final round photo comparison. It's a photo of an orange pumpkin. It's like the perfect finale photo given everything we've been learning about white balance and warmth through this whole time. But here I'm waiting to see if, you know, the photo with the warmer white balance looks more saturated with the pumpkins and wins. And sure enough, the bottom photo by the Mi 10 Ultra is looking more saturated in that side by side. So as we post it, I'm expecting more people to vote for that. And on Instagram, it won. But on Twitter, it got crushed. And that was a weird moment where I was, I was trying to like figure out why that would happen in my head. Maybe I thought because everyone on Twitter has been sort of hyper analyzing this and commenting and replying for so long that by the time you get to the finals, people are scrolling down to the comments and looking at people's talk before they vote. And I guess Instagram stories is just a pure vote, no comments. 
but it was just such a big difference. This guy won by about 30,000 votes on Instagram, and the Zenfone won by about 90,000 votes on Twitter. So that means overall the Zenfone did win the finals, but that was, that was a big swing. So it turns out, and shout out to the people who were voting on both that sent this to me, Instagram stories looks different from Twitter images. See, the images uploaded to Twitter actually look like they both got a boost to saturation to the point where the bottom photo actually looked oversaturated and people overwhelmingly voted for the Zen phone for staying realistic while it looked like the Mi Ultra was way over the top. Then on Instagram, it actually made both photos a little bit more pale. So the top Zen phone actually looked too pale and the bottom photo, which looked closer to realistic, got more votes. Really fascinating stuff, which again, dumps more gasoline on my fire theory that it doesn't really matter exactly what your photo looks like when you take it and when you edit it, as long as you like it, post that. So, moral of the story, am I gonna go running out and telling people Zenfone 7 Pro is the new king of smartphone cameras? No, <laughs> but it is very consistent, so I'll give it that. And if you care about that in a smartphone camera, you won't be disappointed with that phone. But generally, the point is everywhere on the internet, you post a photo, it's just gonna look different. This is even true with videos, actually. When I post a video on YouTube, it looks different on my computer versus by the time it gets chewed up and spit out through YouTube on your monitor or someone else's phone or someone else's laptop. And this is also true about all our photos and different social media platforms. So at the end of the day, just make what you wanna make, post it, and be happy with that. Don't worry too much about the tools themselves. Do the best you can with what you've got because that's what we're all doing at the end of the day.